excited to be at church this morning? Wow, man. You guys sound as excited as I am. We're live on Facebook. We have to be excited. Aren't you guys excited to be here? <laughs> oh, man. I, I got to be honest with you. I've been going through a really difficult time uh, the last couple of weeks. Um, my daughter turned 12 um, this last week, and I can't handle how old they're getting. It's been very difficult for You guys can laugh. They won't hear you on the recording. Um, it's been <laughs> some pity laughs there. Uh, it's been really difficult, though, for me to realize that my kids are growing up really, really fast. Um, and I, I just don't know what to do with myself. Like, they just keep getting older and older. We were, we were doing family pictures, and my wife was like, who is that adult woman over there taking that, that picture? And I said, well, that's the photographer. And she said, no, not her. She said, Audrey, our daughter. And I said, oh, okay, yeah. I was like, yeah, she's like 12 going on 25. What is happening to our lives? Um, our son is, I'm giving you guys a life update here. I, you could just read it on Facebook. I'm just going to tell you. Um, our, our son is uh, going to be 15. He's 14. I know, thank you. I heard my wife was yelling out at me. He's 14, going to be 15. And he's just so concerned. He's a freshman in high school, concerned with his grades in school. And I'm just, I just can't believe what's happening before my eyes. I just continually are growing up and growing up, and I'm getting older, and it's, it's just not fair. Why do bad things happen to good people? That's what I keep asking, and, and I just don't understand, Lord, why this is happening to me. We had a deal. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of the, the way that life goes. My wife and I um, just celebrated 15 years for our wedding anniversary. You guys can clap because she put up with me. For 15 years, she continually gets prettier, and I continue to get uglier as time goes on. It's this weird dynamic, but um, it's, it's fine. Um, we usually go away for some things for our anniversary, and, and this, last, uh, this last anniversary, we were so busy with church planning in Pendleton and, and just getting acclimated with the new school system. We kind of did like a stay-at-home anniversary, and we stayed home a few days, and we spent a lot of time with our dog. Um, during that time, our dog, uh, we have this, this chocolate lab. He is like six months old, five, six months old, and he's just so full of energy. Um, we, we find that like he just absolutely has to be next to us, and we have to touch him, and you have to pet him. And, and so while we're home you know, for this romantic stay-at-home anniversary, our dog is like clouding and coming into all of our time. But um, it's, it's a funny thing. When you have this kind of chaotic family and everybody's working in these different directions, um, family chores are sometimes more challenging, I feel like, um, as our kids are running in different directions because um, there's all these miscommunications. For, what we realized for a while was, it was we were kind of like quizzing the kids. Hey, did somebody feed the dog? I didn't feed the dog. I didn't feed the dog. I didn't feed the dog. And then we were like, nobody fed the dog this morning. And so everybody, then it goes to the other extreme. You guys probably know how this goes. Everybody feeds the dog. Everybody's feeding it. Did you feed the dog? Yeah, I did. No, but I did. Oh, I did too. And so everybody fed the dog. But the dog doesn't care. This dog is this endless pit, this endless void that... He just keeps eating. I mean, you can feed him, and he still goes back to the bowl. He's like, I'm ready for more. I'm ready for... I picture he, like, talks to us, and he talks really fast, and he's like, hey, Master, I'm, I'm ready for more. I'm ready for more. But um, he just... He just <laughs> nobody else says dog voices for the dog. Anyways, so our dog... <laughs> I'm crazy. Uh, man, you guys are making me feel crazy. But uh, our dog, he's just like this endless void. Now, stay with me. I'm going to make this comparison between my dog and us, each of us. Stay with me. But I think sometimes, I think all the time, that God created us with this void in, in our life. And as we navigate through this life, we're constantly trying to fill this void that he's created us with. And just like my dog, I'm not saying your dog, please hear me out. We try to fill it, and it just, it's bottomless because we're not filling it with the right things. For this playlist series, I'm really excited to debut it because I love music, and uh, I feel like music speaks to me in a lot of different ways. On our anniversary weekend, though, my wife and I, we went and seen a movie. Um, really awesome. I know we're real extravagant for our anniversary. We went and seen a movie. What would you do for your anniversary? We went and seen a movie. Um, but we did, and my wife said, I really want to see this one. Um, 
it's called A Star is Born. It's about this musician and this other musician and, and their lives and how they intertwined. And I, I can kind of relate to the musicians because I'm a musician in different ways. And so it really spoke to me. But this, this song, in the song, you'll see kind of the void that they're trying to fill and they're, they're conversing with each other. But we're going to play it for you guys and you can see their conversation. I love get Lady Gaga or Lady Gag. We had a <laughs> we had a social media post <laughs> when we did this playlist series last time, and it was like weeks or it was the days before somebody caught it. But it said Joe Deckard performs Lady Gags, and somebody was like Lady Gag. Who's Lady Gag? <laughs> Lady Gaga. It's hard enough to say. Um, the lyrics of this song display. As I read several articles about it as well, I, I realized that the, they're conversing with each other and they're challenging each other for the void that they're trying to fill in their hearts. And, and they're filling it with worldly things like stardom and fame and attraction and substance abuse. And I, I think the reality is, is that we are created with a void. That God created each of us with this void and probably the harder reality for us to take in is that we fill it with unhealthy things sometimes. And we navigate through this life 
at different times replacing it with God. And he's the only one that can fill it. And there was a story um, in the Bible, um, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, that really where Jesus tackles this void and he talks about it and brings it forward. And the symbolism talking about a well. It's a very popular story. You've probably heard it before. Um, But John chapter 4, and I'm going to kind of just skip through this really quick because it's kind of a long story and it's drawn out, but I'm going to pull out the most important parts, and I would really challenge you to read it for yourself. Um, Jesus asked her, he's, the setting is, is that he's sitting there, and uh, he had been traveling from Judea to Galilee, and he stopped in a small town called Samaria. And in this, in this town, there was this well, and it's kind of like in the middle of a desert, and he's sitting there just hanging out, doing what Jesus does, you know, talking to people. And, and uh, some, some believe that the only reason he traveled to Samaria was for this encounter with this woman. And I would tend to believe that's probably true. He, you know, he was there for a purpose, very intentional to meet this woman. And uh, this, this well was kind of short. The sides of it was short, but still tall enough that livestock couldn't fall in. But it was deep. And being as hot as it was, as you'd pull that water out, it'd be very lukewarm and not really satisfying. And so this woman was approaching. Jesus is hanging out, sitting on the side of the well. And this woman approaches, and the Samaritan woman, and she has this water jug. And he asks her if, if, she would, if she would give him a drink. And I think there's different parts of this that are really significant. I'm going to try and pull those out for you that we could see. But the very first thing is verse 6. It's, it's talking about how he sat there and, and uh, he needed a drink of water. And I, I really believe that this points to, which is the Gospel of John, it points to this, that Jesus was a very, very... Um, he, in, this, in this time, he was displaying his humanness, that he, would ex, that he would experience the things that we experience so that we could understand, so that he could... We could know that he understands. I I can get it out. I think I can get it out. Um, So that we would know that he understands how we feel. And he's a very, very personal God. And he was thirsty, and he was wore out from this long trip. And so he's sitting there, and he says, why don't you give me a drink? Let's talk. Let's be friends. And she pushed back, and she said, but you're a Jewish man, and I'm a Samaritan woman. And that time, they, they didn't converse. They, they didn't like each other. And there was a lot of reasons. But I think it's very interesting and significant to notice that Jesus didn't care about that. We struggle in this country, don't we, with equality and racism and gender and, and differences of that. And, and Jesus, he, he didn't care about that. He knew that person mattered, and he loved that person. He wanted an encounter with that woman. And so he... You know, she, he said there, you know, bring me a drink. Complete equality. And she said, you know, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. And, and he said, if you only knew the free gift of God. In verse 10, he said, if you only knew who I am, you would have responded differently. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that drinks, that asks you for this drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you would ask me, I would give you living water. You don't need that water. What I have will quench your thirst. What I have will be enough. What I have will be satisfying. You don't need that lukewarm, tepid, nasty... If you guys know me, I'm a germaphobe. I am a germaphobe. If you haven't heard the stories, I can't drink after people. It just freaks me out. And the thought of people dipping into this well over and over... I just can't do it. I can't do it. But he's saying, don't settle for that. I got the real deal here. The living water. And he's not necessarily talking about the water, right? He's talking about who he is and why he came and how we should see him. So he gestures towards the well that he told her about. And he said, everyone drinks this water will be thirsty again. Everybody that drinks this is going to be thirsty again. Nothing on this earth truly satisfies, is what he's saying. Nothing that comes out of that 
will satisfy you. Nothing. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. He's giving her so much more. He's giving her something better. And she was willing to settle for less, but he wanted to give her this more. He wasn't going to give up on her either. The truth, I think, is that we must let go of the one to embrace the other. The truth is, is what was happening here was this display, this really physical thing. It's, it's kind of hard for us to get because we don't often go to wells, right? I've, I haven't been to, I don't know that I, I was in, I was at a well, uh, uh, Chris, uh, I was at a well uh, ceremony when I was in Africa once, but I have never drank out of. W- I didn't drink out of the well then. You can't get me to drink out of that thing. I don't care. But I, I, I've never drank out of a well. I don't, I don't get this. But, but we're taking this story and we're seeing what's happening here. And, and what is happening is he's saying this thing is temporal. This here, this is, this is not what you need. What you need is living water which only comes from Jesus, which only comes from me. And it was difficult for her to let go of the things of the world to embrace him, I'm sure, in that moment. But the story goes on that she makes that choice. And I I think for some of us, it's difficult for us to let go of the things of the world and take hold of this living water. Being near the water doesn't count. Going to church, carrying a Bible around, listening to Christian music, seeing every single Christian film as it comes out doesn't count. I've seen Courageous. I've seen Fireproof. I stood in line to see. I can only imagine that Bart Miller was fantastic. It doesn't count. It's this living water. And this living water, when you have drank it, it changes everything. When you accept Jesus into your life, it changes everything. And it's lived out. It says those who drink, and those are the ones who admit that they're thirsty. They know only God has the water they need. The people who open their mouths and take it, they they don't just read the word. They live this word. They live this out. Imagine a life without wanting and wishing and striving, stressing. That's what he's offering. It's not too good to be true, not with God. The problem is, is that we are hardwired with this void inside of us. That's the rub, that's the tension here, is that we are created with a void. We were created to long for something we are created to want and desire and to fill this thing and God will not remove that void from your life he will not he created you that way you were meant to be that way longing for something the problem is is that we fill it with the wrong things the problem is, is we try to satisfy our souls our spiritual soul with things that will never, ever satisfy us. If you break free from a substance abuse, but fill that void with anything else but Jesus, it will just be replaced by another bondage. If you wiggle loose from these emotional dependencies in your life, bad relationships, and you ignore a relationship with God, Another addiction will just take its place. And the cycle goes on and on and on and on. Only God can fill this chasm in your heart. Only God can fill this void that exists within you. So how do I fill it? Well, the number one thing is, and this is not cliche, but you absolutely have to have a relationship with Jesus. He will not remove that void, but he'll fill it. 
with his love and his grace and his contentment and his gratitude. You'll be filled with happiness. The void can't be removed, but it can be filled with an opportunity to live an incredible life. Paul writes that the freedom from bondage was not a freedom from self. He said, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart so that the form of teaching to which you were committed and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You're free from sin. You're free from these, un, these unholy things, these unhealthy things, but you're now free to be his. Isn't that good? Amen. He fills the void. The second thing is he fills it with a purpose. And you have to live this exclusive God purpose life so that he can be glorified, so that God gets the glory, not you. It's a, it's a funny thing that we think that when we accept Jesus into our heart that it's all about us. Look what I got, look what I got. But there's a major shift that happens. It should be now I live my life for him. Now I live my life for him. Now I do this for him. Now I go here for him. Now I'm friends with these people for him. It changes everything. When you take in this living water, when you drink this living water that he was talking about with her, everything changes and it's no longer about you. It's about him and how he loves others and so you love them in that place. When I was... Um, a youth pastor, I had uh, this big school bus that was donated, right? You guys know how I love schoolies. I talk about it all the time. I want an RV that's made out of a school bus. It would be so awesome. Travel the country with my dog. Anyways, and my wife. <laughs> I, didn't, I looked right at you and I said, and my dog. I, there was no description there. I just, she knows I love my dog. Anyways, let's move on. Um, they had, what was I saying? They gave us a big school bus, right? So we painted the school bus, took it on a few youth events. It's really awesome to have all these teenagers in a massive school bus, right? Um, and then uh, this, this other, this Christian choir, they had wanted to borrow it for an event. And we were like, yeah, let's do this. Yeah, you can borrow it. And so one of my kids in my youth group was, was in this choir. And he calls me one night after they had borrowed it. And he said, Joe, the school bus is breaking down. I said, what's going on? And he said, it's like smoking, and it's, it's popping, and it's, it's like only going 10 miles an hour, and then it dies again. And I said, well, what did you do to it? And he said, well, we, we went to the gas station, we put gas in it. I said, wait, what'd you put in it? And he said, we put gas. I said, did you put diesel? And he said, I don't know. And I said, can you go out and look? I'm pretty sure that takes diesel. He, and, you know, he's on the phone. Hang on a sec. Hang on. Yeah, let me look. He's like, uh, no. only put diesel in. Oh, no. And I was like, oh, no. And they had filled that thing up with gasoline, and it just about ruined that school bus. And I was thinking just how very similar that is, that we try to fill up our lives with the wrong thing. And it's very resemblant of how that you will interact in this life with everything else when you fill it up with the wrong thing. Eventually, you will break down. That engine was only created to have diesel fuel in it. At that time, it was created for diesel. That's what it needed. Gasoline, water, sand, Kool-Aid, ginger ale, none of that would work. And isn't it so funny how we fill up this void with all the wrong things? God fills up our hearts when we invite him in. And he fills that void with a peace that you can't get from anywhere else. And I think about that story with the woman at the well. And she was just taking that water jug back and forth, trying to satisfy her thirst. Spiritually speaking, that's what he was bringing to her. Spiritually, you've been doing this. You've been doing this. And we do that, don't we? It looks like busyness. It looks like money, ambition. 
It's bad relationships. It's competitiveness. It's working so hard so that I can prove that I work hard. It's an expectations you set on yourselves. And we do all these things and we're just going to the wrong well. I love my dog. Yeah, my dog, my chocolate lab. His name is Dallas. And uh, we had gotten him. I'm making the transition of us and now to my dog. I'm not supposed to tell you that according to public speaking, but I'm going to do it. Um, this is what's happening right now in my sermon. Um, my dog, Dallas, he is like, uh, we, I was told, I was, it was suggested to us that we get him in my struggles with anxiety. And uh, man, he's been so good for us. Uh, except in the early part when we were potty training him and stuff, that was pretty stressful. I thought, whose idea was this? You got anxiety, get a dog. This is crazy. Um, we're always going to take him out. He always wants something. But my dog, you can tell his sole existence in life is to live for our family. He has to be touched. He has to be with us. He thinks he's like a lap dog, but, you know, he's a massive chocolate lab, and he, like, sits on you and lays on you. You put him in his cage, and he goes crazy. He's, I just got to be with you. I live for you. And I thought, wow, that's really amazing. What if my relationship with God was like that? I had to be with you, Lord. I have to feel you in my life. I can't be away from you. You're constantly trying to be as close as you could to him. Until God's love and acceptance is enough, nothing else will be. Nothing. Until God's love and acceptance is enough, nothing else in your life will be. You will abuse everything that you get. The interesting thing is, if God can fill the void in your heart, he can fill the void in your house and in your family. And if he can fill the void in your house, he can fill the void in a city. So what are the empty places in your life? In your quiet time, in your private time, what are you filling that void with? Is it with everything that God has to offer? Or is it with everything that is wrong for you? God created you with a void. But he promises to fill it. You just have to ask him. Can I ask you guys to stand? We're going to pray and we're going to sing. And I just want to invite the Lord into this place again. I know he's here, but I just want him to hear it from us, that we want him to come. God, I'm so thankful for the life that you called me to live. I'm so thankful for not leaving me in my state of longing, not leaving me in my place of wishing for more, not leaving me in the place where I was trying to fill it with the wrong things, but you saw me just like you saw the woman in the well. And you said, I don't want you to stay there. But you can have living water. God, I pray for every person in this place. There are some people here that have been carrying around this water jug back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and they need to leave that water jug behind. God, I pray that change would happen in this place, that people would know you and have an encounter with you that they couldn't deny. We pray these things in your name. Amen.